My name is Brooke Fleming, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about kind of shark science that might be new to a lot of you. Um, most of my work is actually done in a lab, so, uh, but it is done with live sharks often, and sometimes robots and there's lasers involved, so <laughs> okay, it's going to get a lot better, I promise. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a, a story, actually, about what um, really was a turning point in my career. I first started doing my master's um, studying uh, deep sea cat sharks, and it was really exciting for me from an ecological perspective, but something was missing in my understanding of biology and the way that I saw the world. And for me, it was that what I found truly fascinating about the way an organism interacts with its environment is the physics that are involved in biology and that underlie how animals do things, including how they swim. And so, uh, a lot of the work that's done in my lab is, is dealing with comparative biomechanics and how things move. So what you see here is a shark that's swimming in a flow tank. You're looking at him from the underside there, and he's, um, this is like a treadmill for fish. And, uh, well, it's really sort of what it is. Um, <laughs> so this shark is swimming along here, and we knew that uh, this is a funny dogfish, which people have been looking at for literally hundreds of years, even from an anatomical perspective. Um, and we knew that sharks power their they're swimming by use of muscles, um, and people have been studying the muscles of these sharks for hundreds of years. Um, but what's really fascinating is that if you open up any lab dissection manual, what you're going to see is that there's a lot of um, focus on the area of the head because that's the bitey part and that's where the muscles are that people are concerned about there. And then there's this one very stereotypical figure of what the body muscles look like. So um, I just want to make a, a shout here for being observant and being open to just exploring things, even if you think they've already been done, because sometimes that's where the best observations come from. All of the funnest, the most exciting things in my research have all been completely accidental. And this is the first of many of those. So um, I would say that scientific accidents are the best accidents, hopefully under most non-contaminated situations. <laughs> but in, in this case especially, so I had, I, I don't know how many um, funny doctors I dissected, through high school and, and undergrad years and everything, and, and, and masters. Um, but uh, I had the opportunity to go to a really amazing um, fish biomechanics class at the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Lab one summer, um, when I was just starting to learn about biomechanics. And I started dissecting a shark, and um, having already done so many times, I finished the head, and I finished that little part of the body, and I got bored, and I kept going. And I got to the tail, and I found something that nobody knew what it was. So I get down to the tail of the shark, and this is a close-up on the tail, and you can see I've marked where the dorsal lobe, the top lobe of the tail from the caudal fin is there. Um, and so everybody knows that there's this white body muscle that runs the length of the shark, and that there's this thin strip of red muscle as well, and so I've sort of written those where those are. Um, but what was interesting is that there was this demarcation where everything up here is body muscle, and down here is a separate muscle. All the muscle fibers are running in a different orientation and they're attaching in a different way, and nobody knew what this was. So I had accidentally discovered a brand new muscle in the tail of sharks, purely by being bored in class. <laughs> so after this, I went on to start doing my PhD, and I had the great benefit of um, being at, at Harvard, where I had access to the Museum of Comparative Zoology, and barrels and buckets and jars of sharks of all different sorts that I had that I could go and I could look at. And I found that this muscle was in every single species of shark that I looked at. So it didn't matter if it was a thresher shark. It didn't matter if it was a deep sea cat shark that swam very sluggishly, if it was something that was a, a wide ranging pelagic swimmer. They all had it. And so what that told me was that there's something fundamentally important to swimming like a shark, to having this muscle, that they absolutely required this in order to be able to swim. And so I got to name it, um, and I named it the radialis muscle, mostly to be in line with other anatomical muscle in the tails of fishes. And at this point, I had all these dissected models, but I wanted to know how it actually worked, because it was great that it was in all these things, but I didn't know anything else about it. So this is where being able to have sharks in the lab and work with them hands-on gets a lot more exciting. So. What I do is, sharks are on treadmills here, we have this, I have a flow tank. It's basically through circulating water that I can control the speed of. I turn the speed up, the shark swims faster, just like you do on a treadmill, and so I can get it to swim in front of my high-speed cameras um, at any speed that I want to, and take a look at how it's moving. 
What I can also do is to anesthetize it and implant electrodes that are about the, the same thickness as your hair into its muscles and get electrical recordings of how the muscles are working when it's actually swimming. So long story short, what you're seeing here is these are electrical impulses of, that are happening as the shark is moving its tail from left to right and back again, just at a leisurely half a body length per second swimming speed here. Um, and the muscle activity, what is happening is, is as the tail's all the way to one side, it fires when it's in the middle. And then it, it goes off again when the tail reaches the other side. So, and it's firing on the side of the tail that is coming um, into the flow. So as my hand is moving here, it's the tail, the muscle on this side is firing, and it's coming back, the muscle on this side is firing. So that was really cool. It had this really conserved pattern in activation. Again, sort of striking home that this is just a, a fundamentally important part of shark swimming. Well, we have a lot of other cool tools in our disposal in the lab and trying to figure out how these things actually work. Um, and so this is a, this another view of the lab set up here. And in here, um, in that glass area, is the, the working area where the shark swims. So that's the, the area of the treadmill where they stay stationary. And then I have a lot of camera equipment here. Um, and we shine a laser that comes out underneath the flow tank, hits a mirror, and comes up. And inside the water, it illuminates all these particles that are super, super small, um, around 50 micron uh, nominal size. And what happens is that this allows us to actually visualize the water moving. So this is how we can do a fluid dynamic analysis and try and understand the forces that are being generated when this fish is swimming and try and see how this muscle is um, allowing the shark to be able to swim and look at how it's, how it's interacting with the water. So let's, let's examine this a little bit closer. Um, how did sharks generate crust? I realize this is not a shark. <laughs> this is a very charismatic bluegill sunfish, but it was the best picture of a fish tail in the laser beam that I had. So, but this is to give you an idea of what it looks like. So we see, you can see the fish swimming and its tail is in the laser there, and you might even be see the particles that are illuminated. Um, and so five seconds crash course on fluid dynamics. When you move in the water, you push water away, right? So you're exerting a first force on the water. This is adding some sort of momentum to the water. This causes thrust. Okay. So, and you may have seen something like this visualized as to what the aerodynamics, fluid dynamics looks like if you've ever seen a smoke ring. So when you push water, the water you're pushing is the jet that's the green center there. But all around that jet, water is rolling, and so you get this characteristic ring called a vortex. That's a wake signature that we're looking for when we're studying the, the movement of those particles in the laser light. So, in case of the shark, we got something like this. Okay. Now, I just want to point out first that this one single flying donut, as we'll call it, um, <laughs> is what we would expect to see with something like a blue sunfish, like a bony fish with a flexible fin. The shark structure, the weight that's created, is so different than that. It's two rings together with a single pass of the tail. And what you're seeing is this first ring here is the one that's generated halfway through the tail beat when the radialis muscle fires. That, that muscle that you see in all the sharks. And then this one on, on the side is the one that you see right when it switches directions. So let's think about comparing this. What it told us is that this is an increased way, a way to swim more in efficiently for sharks. So something like this um, bluegill sunfish here, anything flapping in the water, your hand, a ribbon, anything going back and forth, typically they only create thrust when they switch direction on either side. That's when they shed momentum to the water and it pushes them forward. So if you watch a fish in the flow tank, it's actually going back and forth while it's swimming because it's not generating thrust the whole time. So you only see, uh, if you're watching its, its weight, it could be left, right, left, right with this momentum being shed. But sharks generate continuous thrust while they're swimming. So this is something that was really novel and they do it by changing the stiffness of their tail when they activate this muscle, which is also something completely new in terms of an engineering concept, because at this point in the world of fluid dynamics and engineering, nobody really thought about the fact that you could generate momentum in the water by changing stiffness in real time. We had always just thought about, about the shape of something moving and how it was moving. 
I just want to end with one fun fact here. So the next time that you see something on TV or you go to the aquarium with your friends, you can impress them with your, your shark biomechanics knowledge. <laughs> is that when you're watching sharks swimming in the water, even when they're swimming in a straight line trajectory, their bodies are often tilted. And this is one of the coolest, I think, balancing acts in nature. So sharks are somewhat heavy. They have, they have mass and they're not mutually buoyant. So if a shark stops swimming, it tends to sink. It needs to swim to generate lift to stay up in the water. Well, as it's moving its tail back and forth in the water, and it's creating um, that downward jet here, which is partly downward because of the shape of its tail being slanted like that, and it's generating that continuously because of that radialis muscle, it's generating some lift on the back part of the body. But just like a seesaw, if you lift up one part, the other part goes down. So in order to compensate for that and not go head down swimming, sharks, almost all sharks, swim at a body angle of about 10 to 15 degrees in order to be able to swim straight. So they have to. They have to generate lift at the front of their body in order to do this. With that, I just like to say thank you.